Now at the same time, there came disciples to Jesus saying, Who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? <laughs> oh, boy, how they long for this. It, you're talking about motivation. And, and, you know, the disciples were not pure in their motivations. They were always wrangling about, well, I'm going to be bigger than you. I'll be better than you. I'll have a better place than you, you know. And, and their motivations were not always the purest. And they many times were arguing about these Things, the greatest. In fact, even the mothers of the disciples sometimes got in on this and said, Lord, when you come into your kingdom, would you let one of my sons be on your right side and the other on the left side? Yeah. <laughs> Little Jewish mothers wanting to set up their boys, you know, and that's, that's very typical. God bless them. And so the disciples came and said, who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom? And Jesus called a little child unto him. And he set the child in the middle of them. And he said, verily I say unto you, except you be converted and become as little children, you shall not even enter the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. The true path to greatness is always the path of humility. He that exalteth himself shall be abased. He that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Humble thyself in the eyes of the Lord and he shall lift you up. And Jesus takes a child and says, look, you've got to become like a little child if you're even going to enter the kingdom of heaven. And so if you'll humble yourself as a little child, that person will be the greatest. The path to greatness is the path of servanthood. How important that we learn to serve that we not be looking for ourselves, but we only be looking for our Lord and to exalt Him. And whoso shall receive one such little child in my name receives me. Oh, how the Lord loves the little children. How He loves their beautiful little faces. How He loves that simple faith and trust that is in the heart of a child. There's something about their innocency and, and simplicity that is absolutely glorious. I love it. But he said, Whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. I love Jesus. He's a man's man. Sounds like the mafia here, but I'm all for it. I mean, he's straight. I think that the most heinous sin anyone can commit is to seek to destroy the faith of a child in God. That is one of the worst sins that anyone could ever commit. To take this pure little child with his simplicity and trust in God and deliberately seek to destroy that child's faith in God, in Jesus Christ. Jesus said, look, it would be better for a man if you just took a millstone. And these millstones weigh about three, four hundred pounds. Tie it around his neck and toss him into the sea. Better that that happened to him than he offend, destroy the faith of one of these little ones who believe in me. Woe unto the world because of offenses. 
For it must needs be that offenses come, but woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. Be careful. Offenses are going to come, but be careful that you're not the cause of the offenses. Wherefore, if your hand offends you, then cut it off. Cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life halt or maim rather than having two hands or two feet and to be cast into the everlasting fire. If thy eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes be cast into hell fire. So take heed that you despise not one of these little ones, for I say unto you that in heaven, and I love this, their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. The angels that have been given charge over us to keep us in all of our ways. The angels who are watching over our little children. Their faces are before the Father continually there in heaven, beseeching the Father for these precious little ones. This business of thy hand offend thee and all is, is something that Jesus meant to be repugnant. He means it to be shocking. To maim my own body to me is a very repugnant Pugnant idea to lose a hand, to lose an eye by my own doing is just a horribly repugnant thought and Jesus wanted it to be. He did not literally mean that we are to cut off our hand or to pluck out our eye, but he is only illustrating how vital it is that we enter the kingdom of heaven. It is worth more than having a whole body. As we were talking to you last Sunday about the trapping of muskrats, how that if you catch them by their paw, they'll turn around and gnaw their leg off and leave the paw in the trap. Again, that's a, you know, kind of a thought that sort of gives us a, a we, we react mentally to that as, ooh, horrible, but yet how wise as far as the muskrat is concerned. For he figures better to be a free muskrat with three paws than having four paws be tacked on a fur board. So Jesus is saying much the same thing here. Uh, in a, in a, if there's something in your life that is causing you to stumble, if there's something in your life that is creating an offense, cut it out. Get rid of it. Sometimes when a person comes into the office and sits down and begins to pour out their story, And they say, well, Chuck, I'm really in a mess. I I never thought it would happen to me and I can't understand it, but um, man, I'm involved in an affair. And and I don't know what to do. You know, it's just ripping me apart. It's tearing me up. My wife doesn't know it and, and, and I just don't know what to do about it and all. I say to them, point blank, cut it off. Not tomorrow. Right now. Cut it off. Oh, but I don't... Cut it off. I said, if I were a surgeon and you came to me, And you said, oh, I'm having these lumps under my arm and they're sore and 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 they really bother me. If I didn't bother to take the biopsies and determine whether or not you had cancer of the lymph nodes, but I just said, oh, you know, probably you've got cancer in your lymph nodes, but, you know, that's a painful operation. We don't, you know, we don't want to go through the pain of it. 
why don't we just sort of take aspirin and so you won't feel the pain and, and, and forget about it? Why, you'd file a malpractice suit against me for quackery. <laughs> Saying, well, you know, just let it go and see what happens. And I said, now you're coming to me with a spiritual malady that is more deadly than cancer. I'm the surgeon and I'm telling you, we've got to operate immediately. Your life depends on it. You've got to cut it out. And if there is some sin that you're tolerating, allowing, playing with and, and messing around with, you cannot do it. Jesus is saying, cut it off. Better to go through life maimed than into hell whole. And then Jesus in verse 11 says so beautifully, For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. I love that. We'll get to that when we get to Luke's gospel and it amplifies it a little further. Now Jesus said, what do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them is gone astray, will he not leave the ninety-nine and go into the mountains and seek the one which has gone astray? And if it so happens that he finds it, verily I say unto you, he rejoices more for the one sheep than for the ninety-nine which never went astray. Even so, it is not the will of your father which is in heaven, that one of these little ones should perish. Your Father is watching over them. Their angel faces to behold the face of the Father continually, and He isn't willing that any of them perish. Be careful that you do not offend one of those little ones who believes and trusts in Him. Moreover, Jesus said, if your brother trespasses against you, go and tell him the fault between you and him, alone. And if he hears you, then you've gained your brother. This is the way differences are to be resolved and settled within the church. Now, if he does not hear you, then take with you one or two witnesses so that, by, so that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. Take another person with you or another two people with you and face him with the issue again. And if he neglects to hear them, then take it before the church. But if he neglects to hear the church, then let him be as a heathen, a publican, an upright sinner, a rank sinner. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say unto you, that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything, that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. So, here Jesus is speaking about loosing and binding, loosing the work of God, binding the work of Satan, and then declaring that if two of us, so the value of, of uh, prayer together, an agreement in prayer. Now, most of our prayer is done in private. But there are times when agreement in prayer is extremely valuable. And I encourage every one of you to have a prayer partner. Someone that when something really is troubling you, you have someone that can pray with you and bear that burden with you. For if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it will be done for them by my Father which is in heaven. The power of agreement in prayer. Then Jesus goes on with this two or three concept. He said four where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. So, the simplest 
form of the church is just two or three people getting together to worship the Lord, to pray together. And whenever there are two, there are always three. Wherever there are three visibly present, there's always four. Jesus said, I am in the midst of them. I think that it is important that we have and somehow can conceptualize this. Jesus isn't like some today who say, well, the crowd's too small. I'm not going to go out there tonight, you know. He said, if two or three are gathered, I'll be there. Now, what you need to conceptualize and to realize is the fact that Jesus is here tonight. Now, if you have a real need and you knew Jesus was there, what would you do? You'd say, hey, Lord. <laughs> Problems. And don't you know that if you could see him, if he actually stood here visibly, if you could reach out and touch him, you know that the problems would all go. He could do it. You know he can do it. So many times you probably wish, oh, if I could only be at Capernaum and, and Jesus was there and if I could only... You know, just have him lay his hands on me. Hey, he is here. The fact that you cannot see him is of no import at all. Because he said he would be here in the midst of us. And you can reach out by faith and touch him tonight. And he will reach out and touch you. All you have to do is make that contact of faith with him. He's here. Realize that. Bring before him your need. Believe him and trust him. And he will work in you. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Seven times. Now, I imagine that Peter at this point thought, you know, I'm really setting a great example here. I'm sure that he was stretching in his own mind his uh, knowledge of his own ability to forgive. I'm sure when he said seven times, he was going far beyond what he knew he could do. I'm sure Peter was thinking, well, I might be able to forgive a guy a couple of times, but it will sound good to the other disciples if I say seven, you know. And, and Jesus will probably say, look, here's the guy that's really getting the lesson. Listen to him, fellas. Peter's really got it here, you know. Lord, how often shall I forgive my brother the very same offense? He's doing the same thing. Uh, seven times? <laughs> Jesus said unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. I, 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 490? <laughs> now, what Jesus is pointing out basically is that forgiveness is not a matter of mathematics, it's a matter of spirit. That you should have the spirit of forgiveness. And I'm certain that he is certain that if you take the 490 that you'll lose count before you ever get there and you'll just realize, hey, it isn't a matter of numbers, it's a matter of spirit. I'm to have the spirit of forgiveness. And then Jesus went on to illustrate it. He said, therefore, is the kingdom of heaven likened to a certain king which would take account of his servants. 
And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents, about $16 million. But inasmuch as he did not have any money to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, his wife and his children, and all that he had in order that a partial payment might be made. And the servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, O Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion, and he freed him, and he forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. About $3,000. And he laid his hands on him and took him by the throat saying, You pay me what you owe me. And the fellow servant fell down at his feet and he begged him saying, Have patience with me and I will pay you everything. But he would not. He had him cast into the debtor's prison until he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done... They were very grieved and they came and told their Lord all that he did. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, Oh, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you desired me to. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant, even as I had pity on you? And his Lord was angry and delivered him over to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due from him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you if you, careful note, from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother their trespasses. Heavy duty lesson on forgiveness. Now, the analogy is very clear and obvious. God has forgiven you so very much, all of your past sins. Who are you to hold a little grudge or a grievance against your brother, not forgive him? because of some slight or some mean thing that he has said about you or some dirty thing that he has done to you. Who are you to hold this bitterness and unforgiving spirit? Jesus said, look, if you don't forgive them from your heart, your father won't forgive you your debt. Now, that is heavy. You say, well, explain it to us. I can't. You want me to explain it away? I can't. You say, well, doesn't that work then? Forgiveness on works. I don't know what it is, but it's the word of Jesus and you better take heed. Now, the Lord has never commanded us to do anything but what he will not give us the capacity to do it if we are willing The problem is we are not often willing to forgive. The Lord is saying it's got to be more than just a forgiving of words. Oh, I forgive you, you know, but you do that again and you're going to get it. (laughs) I forgive you, but I won't forget. I'll bury the hatchet, but I'll leave the handle showing so I can grab it whenever I need it. The forgiveness is from the heart. Forgiveness is a matter of heart. It's a matter of spirit. And inasmuch as God has commanded it, God will give me the capacity if I am willing. But I've got to be willing. And so I have to pray, Oh God, give to me that spirit of forgiveness. God, I am bitter. God, I am angry with what they've done. 
I have done. Lord, I am upset over this thing and I don't want to forgive. I want vengeance, God, but I know that that is not of you. Father, give to me the spirit of forgiveness. Give to me forgiveness in my heart. God, take away this bitterness. Take away this unforgiving spirit that I have and I will receive God's help if I am willing. But I must be willing. But I must do it. That is a must. Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished these sayings, he departed from Galilee and he came to the coast of Judea. Now that is the borders of Judea. So he's moving south towards Jerusalem. For Jerusalem lies in the area of Judea, which is in the southern kingdom. So he's left the area of Naphtali and Sychar up in the north. And it's come down now to the area of Judah. There beyond Jordan. And great multitudes followed him and he healed them there. Then the Pharisees also came unto him and notice this. They were tempting him. This is a test question. It is a leading question. It is a question of entrapment. They are trying to trap Jesus in his words. And it is important that you realize that this is a trap question by the Pharisees. So they came unto him, tempting him or trapping him and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Now, under the Mosaic law, it says if a man finds an uncleanness in his wife and he is not content to remain with her, let him give her a writing of a bill of divorcement. Now, what is meant by finding an uncleanness in her? According to the liberal theologians of those days, an uncleanness could be her not fixing the kind of breakfast you enjoy. So if she, you know, boiled the egg too long and the yolk was too hard, you can say, that's it, I've had it. I divorce you and you can hand her the paper and she had to leave. I mean, she had no recourse. Uh, she was just out. And so they had applied a very liberal interpretation to this finding an uncleanness in her. Other of the rabbis said that the uncleanness was a moral uncleanness. You discovered she was not a virgin when you married her or if she would break the marriage vow. That it was a moral uncleanness. And so there was the division uh, among the scribes and Pharisees of to, uh, to which of the two schools uh, they subscribed. Whether Hillel, who took the very narrow uh, moral uncleanness, or the other school that took a very much broader view. So they were questioning Jesus. Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he which made them in the beginning... Now notice Jesus is going back, not to the law, but he's going back to the beginning. He who made them in the beginning made them male and female. Now, there's quite a move on foot today to change what God has done. <laughs> They'll never be successful. God help poor, sick humanity. I don't know if there's any transvestites here, but I cannot for the life of me. Understand that kind of a sickness, really. God made them male and female.
and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Wherefore, they are no more two, but they are one. There is a unity that is brought about by marriage where the two become one flesh. Of course, that is literally true in your offspring. The two of you have become one flesh in your offspring. As 23 of the chromosomes come from each of you. To begin that new life. How beautiful. (laughs) You dads can't say, that's your kid, you know, take care of him. (laughs) Because he's half yours too, 23 chromosomes from you. And so it is a perfect combination. The two shall become one flesh. Wherefore, they are no more two, but they are one What therefore God hath joined together, let not man, by a writing of divorcement or whatever, put asunder. Now, in those days, women didn't have the the power of divorce, and that's why God said, don't let man put it asunder. Don't let man break it. God has made the two of you one. Now, don't let a man break that by writing out a divorcement for his wife. Now, they said unto him, And now picture the trap closing. Ah, He's fallen into it. You know, because it was a trap question and he fell right into it. All right, we got him now. And they said unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? Now, all of them recognized that the law that Moses gave came from God. If anything was inspired in the Bible, it was the law of Moses. And there were many of them that only believed that that part, and today still many only believe that the first five books of the Bible are inspired. But they all hold that that is the inspired word. God gave us the law by Moses. Now, you are contradicting God. You see, this is the whole idea, to put him in in contradicting what God said. And God said, let him put her away. And you're saying, you can't. You shouldn't. If God has joined you together, you shouldn't break it by writing out a divorcement. So you're against God, is the whole idea. And Jesus said unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, allowed you to put away your wives. But again, he's going back before Moses ever came on the scene. From the beginning, it was not so. You know, in the first part, he said, in the beginning, God made them male and female. Now he's saying, in the beginning, it wasn't so. Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, gave the law for divorcing. But in the beginning, this was not God's intention. In the beginning, this is not what God desired or planned. And I say unto you, now Moses said, but I say, whosoever shall put away his wife except it be for fornication. And notice, he does make the exception. And shall marry another commits adultery. And whoso marries her which is put away doth commit adultery. His disciples said to him, Lord, if that's the case, better that a guy not marry. Now, Jesus is being very straight. He's telling you what is God's original plan for man, one marriage for life. In the beginning, this is what God intended when he made them male and female, that the two become one so that the children will always have both parents and the security of a home 
and a home environment in which to grow up. And wherever that breaks down, we find its effects throughout our entire social structure. And we see it today, the tremendous breakdown in our society and the social order because of the divided families. And the children are always hurt as a byproduct of this division. Now, Jesus did give the one cause, and that one cause is fornication. And in that case, the innocent party would be free to remarry. Very plainly declares that if they Put away their wife except for fornication and marry another. But the exception is there. Now Jesus said unto his disciples when they were shocked at the straightness of his declaration. All men cannot receive this saying except to those to whom it is given. Now this is the next saying that he's talking about. For there are some who are eunuchs which were so born from their mother's womb. There are others who are eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men. And there be some eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. If you're able to receive it, let him receive it. Um, I'm not able, so I just let it go. Uh, I'm not a eunuch, <laughs> nor do I desire to be. Then were there brought unto him little children that he should put his hands on them and pray for them. And his disciples rebuked them. That is the parents that were bringing them. But Jesus said, Allow the little children, don't forbid them to come to me. For of such is the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and he departed from there. Oh, I can get just such a beautiful picture of Jesus and the little children thronging around him and the love and the interest that he had in these little ones. And here the disciples thinking they were protecting him said, Oh, no, no, don't bother the Lord, you're little kids. She said, Wait a minute. Hey, get out of the way, Peter. Let that little one come to me. Don't forbid him. Of such is the kingdom of heaven. Laid his hands on them. Bless them. Oh, love it. And behold, one came and said to him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? Well, here is the moralist. We see them today. People who are looking for some work whereby they might obtain the gift of eternal life. There are always those who are wanting to work their way into God's favor, work their way into God's blessings. If you'll just pray, then God will bless you. If you'll just fast, then God will bless you. If you'll just give, then God will bless you. How many want a blessing? Then dig deep and give tonight. You know, and, and there are always those who want to do some work to obtain God's blessing upon their lives. What good work must I do? that I may inherit eternal life. There's not a single work that you can do. Jesus later said, with man it's impossible. There's no way that you can do any kind of a work that will save you. Salvation, eternal life, is the gift of God and it's not of works lest any man should boast. We are His workmanship. And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one that is God. Now here he said, Good master. Jesus said, Why did you call me good? There's only one that is good, and that is God. Now, obviously, Jesus is saying one of two things. He is saying, I am no good, or he is saying, I am God. Which do you think he is saying? Now, 
What he is doing is trying to awaken the consciousness of this man to the fact that he has received a divine revelation. He's getting close. Why did you call me good? The reason why you call me good is because you, though you don't realize it, have recognized something about me. Why did you call me good? You remember when Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, Jesus said, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. Jesus is saying much the same. Hey, why did you call me good? Flesh and blood didn't reveal this. There's a divine revelation here. You call me good, but there's only one that is good, and that is God. You call me good because I am God. You've recognized something here. What must I do to have this eternal life, this age-abiding life, this quality of life that you have? This quality that I'm observing and am drawn to. And Jesus is beginning to point out the way. First of all, the recognition of who I am. Why did you call me good? There's none good but God. And he said, and and Jesus said, But if you will enter into life, keep the commandments. And he said unto him, Which? And Jesus said, Thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Notice now, nothing is said of the first table of the law. Nothing is said of man's relationship to God. He did not give him the first four commandments. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make any graven images to bow down to them, to worship them. Um, I don't know what happened. Got all my buttons. <laughs> Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain and remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. He didn't bring out any of the first four, man's relationship with God. He only dealt with man's relationship with man because this man was a moralist. He was that typical man who was looking for a good work that he might do in order to inherit eternal life. He was used to doing good works, that his life was spent in doing good works. And so Jesus gave to him those commandments that dealt with his relationship with fellow men. And as Jesus flashed these before his eyes, he answered and said unto him, All of these have I kept from my youth, but what lack I yet? Now, here's a man who is rich, He is a moralist. He's kept his relationship with his fellow men all that it should be. Throughout his life, he's tried to do the good thing, the right thing to his fellow man. And yet he is conscious that there is a lack in his life. I don't yet have what you have. What lack I yet? He was conscious that there was still a lack in his own life, that there must be something more than just living a good life and being wealthy. What lack I yet? And Jesus said unto him, If you will be complete, totally complete, perfect, Then go and sell what you have and give it to the poor and thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. Now I'd like to read to you what Jesus is essentially saying to him. If you will be perfect or complete, come follow me. The rest is only incidental. With the rest there is no universal application. That was an individual commandment to that man it is not a universal application this was not a requirement to any person who is going to be complete or to have eternal life it doesn't mean that you've got to sell everything you have and distribute it to the poor now in the early church there was a movement of this sort it ended in financial disaster it also ended 
ended in some personal calamities. When the church first started, people were very excited what, about what was happening and they were anticipating the Lord to return immediately and a lot of them began to sell their properties and bring the price and lay it at the apostles' feet. And there was one couple, Ananias and Sapphira, who sold their property and they brought in part of the money and put it at Peter's feet. And Peter said, hey, wait a minute. Why have you conspired in your heart to lie against the Holy Spirit? You've not lied against men, you've lied against God. As long as the property was yours, did anyone require you to sell it? And even after you sold it, no one required that you bring everything in. But yet you're making this pretense of bringing everything. You're trying to deceive God. And, and so there was swift judgment upon Ananias and his wife Sapphira, not because they didn't bring everything. Peter makes it very clear that they weren't required to sell their possessions. They weren't required to bring the money in. It was something that people did out of their own volition and free will. And so Jesus, when he says, go and sell what you have and distribute it to the poor, is not making a universal demand for those who would have eternal life. What is the universal demand is come and follow me. You cannot have eternal life apart from following Jesus Christ. But he will always put the finger on whatever it is in your life that's keeping you from following him. And with the case of this rich young ruler, the thing that was keeping him from following Jesus Christ was his riches. That was his God. Jesus said you cannot serve God and mammon. You can't have two masters. If you have a false God that is controlling your life, then you've got to go and get rid of it, whatever it be. And you've got to have the true God on the throne of your life. Jesus says, come, follow me. Why did you call me good? There's only one good, that's God. You call me good because you recognize that I'm God. Now follow me. Get rid of the false gods. Get rid of the empty gods. Follow me, the true and the living God. And it's important that you observe this because a lot of people make a big deal over, you know, well, you've got to go and sell everything you have and distribute it to the poor and all. Not so. That is not of universal application. The universal application is come, follow me. He is the way to completeness. He is the way to eternal life. There is not any real life apart from him. Now, when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Sorry, because he was so rich. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again I say, it is easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And when his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, Who then can be saved? And, with, and Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men it's impossible, but with God all things are possible. Now, when you go over to Israel today, the guides, when you get to the... Um, or oh, the Church of the Nativity, they will show you a little sub-gate under the gate into the church. And they'll tell you that that little sub-gate was called the Eye of the Needle. And uh, that in the gates of the cities, they always had this little sub-gate, which was called the Eye of the Needle. And in order to get the camel through it, they had to take all of the uh, burden off of the camel's back and it had to get down on the ground and a couple guys behind it pushing and one guy in front of it pulling uh, to get it to squeeze through this little eye of the gate in uh, or the eye of the needle in the gate and they, they say now that's you know what Jesus was talking about isn't that interesting they make it a possibility 
if you struggle hard enough and if you grunt and groan enough, you can actually save yourself? A lot of people would like to have you think that. But Jesus points out that that is entirely false. He's talking not about some little gate that you can, by a lot of effort and grunts and groans, squeeze and get through. He's talking about an eye of a needle that a woman is sewing with and you try and get a camel through that. And that's why the disciples said, Lord, who then can be saved? And note, Jesus said what? With man it is impossible. Remember that. He didn't say, you've got to strain, you've got to struggle, you've got to grunt and groan. Give it your best. He is saying it's impossible. Man cannot save himself. The moralist cannot save himself. No man by good works can save himself. No man by a good work can inherit age-abiding eternal life. It is a gift of God and it is only wrought by a miracle of God in our hearts and lives. For though it is impossible with man, with God all things are possible. It's even possible to save you. And God has done the impossible in saving us tonight. And remember that. With man, it is impossible. That eliminates the moralist completely. You cannot, by your good works, obtain for yourself a place in the kingdom of God. You've got to come as a little child and be converted. And just simply trust in Jesus. Then answered Peter and said unto him, O Lord, we've forsaken all and followed you. What are we going to have therefore? <laughs> you see, you're always looking for that. Now, what have I got coming, Lord? Am I going to be the greatest? Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that you which have followed me in the regeneration, the recreation, in making this new order. When the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of His glory, ye also shall sit upon the twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Now in heaven... John saw the throne of God and there tw were 24 thrones around the throne of God upon which were seated 24 elders. There are many who believe that those 24 elders are actually representative of the church. And of course, if so, then 12 of them would be the apostles. There are some problems with that interpretation, but it is at least one of the interpretations that uh, has been suggested for those 24 thrones, lesser thrones about the throne of God. But nonetheless, Jesus said that they will be sitting upon 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone that hath forsaken, now you've said you've forsaken all to follow me, but everyone who has forsaken his house or his brothers or sisters or his father or his mother or his wife or his children or lands for my name's sake. If you've done it for his name's sake, that is, your wife will not follow you in your commitment, total commitment to Jesus Christ. And as Paul said, if the unbelieving husband is not content to remain, let him depart. No one has left these things, forsaken these things for my sake, but what he shall receive a hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life. So not only does he give you a hundredfold now, but then eternal life. To boot. But many that are first shall be last, 
I think that he is here referring actually to the Jewish nation to whom the gospel was to be preached first. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, the power of God into salvation to all that believe, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. But it was to go to the Jew first and then to the Gentiles. Now they're going to be judging the 12 tribes. Why? Because the 12 tribes basically rejected the Messiah. So those that were first shall be last, and they that are last, that is the Gentiles, shall be first. And so in that kingdom that Jesus establishes, we shall be one with him, joint heirs with the Son of the glorious kingdom of God throughout eternity. The gospel came to us last, but we have the first privileges in his glorious kingdom who have believed on Jesus Christ. Where we who believe in Jesus Christ are neither Jews nor Greeks, barbarian, Scythian, bond or free, but Christ is everything. We are a whole new nationality. We are new creatures in Christ Jesus. We are a new creation, a new race of people. So you really can't say, well, I'm a um, Irishman or an Englishman or a Scotchman. Uh, you must say, I'm a Christian. You're a new race, you see. We're not related anymore to the whatever ethnic group we came from. We're all one in Jesus Christ. We, we now relate to a new source. Well, you know, that's my old Irish temper. Oh, no, no, that old Irish temper died when the old man died and you became a Christian. Can't pass it off now on the old Irish temper anymore. You're a new creature in Christ. You're a new creation. You're a new race of people in our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, the last many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Next week, we'll continue in the next three chapters of Matthew's Gospel. Shall we pray? Father, again, we thank you for your word. Truly, it is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. May we walk in its light, be obedient unto its truth, that we, Lord, would not seek to mold and shape your word to our concepts, but that we would have our concepts molded and shaped by your word. Help us, Father, that we might bend our necks to the authority of your truth rather than trying to bend the truth to fit our loose lifestyles. Jesus, let thy word penetrate our hearts and give us, O oh God, a spirit of obedience and a spirit of forgiveness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.